Ryan Thomas at the East West here, and welcome to the fifth session in our East West Academy series, which takes you through the entire process of music production from beginning to end. Now, this is actually the first in a two-part series on MIDI programming, which is a bit of a catch-all term just having to do with the various ways that you can shape and manipulate virtual instrument performances. Now, often this process is geared towards achieving more realism, but sometimes it's just about producing something that sounds amazing. So most of the examples that we'll be using in this video are from the demo that you just heard at the beginning of this video. So this one is gonna be absolutely packed with content. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's start by talking about simple sustains and legatos and when to use them. Now, a simple sustain, which I'm just gonna call a sustain from now on, is going to give you a basic attack and release, but the notes are not going to be connected. So if you noticed, the transitions between all of those notes were fairly sudden and abrupt. Now, if I switch to a legato articulation, now you're gonna start hearing all those beautiful transitions between those notes that are essentially, in the case of the strings, reflecting the finger sliding to the next position. Now, one big difference that you'll wanna be aware of is that non-legato sustains are polyphonic, meaning you can play multiple notes at the same time. Whereas legato articulations are monophonic, meaning you can only play one note at a time. So if you try to play multiple notes at the same time with a legato patch and experience some unusual behavior, that's why. Now, I have found when working with strings, at least in my experience, if all of the notes in a passage are connected like they are in this one, it's generally best practice to use legato. Now, you could use sustains if you were uh, writing something like this. So, you know, just some simple arcs like that. But for a passage like this, I think it's probably best to use legato. So let's go ahead and hear it with just the sustains. So mostly you just have some simple block chord movement with a little bit of faster movement in the first violins and celli. So now let's hear this with the legato strings. So I think the difference when all of the strings were just changing chords in unison was fairly subtle. But when I really noticed the benefit of those legato transitions was around measure 69, where the celli and the violins had some movement. Now, I do find that the various instrument groups tend to play by a slightly different set of rules when it comes to the question of whether you should use a legato or just a sustain for a given passage. Now, if I'm using strings, and the notes are otherwise sustained and connected. Yes, I'm probably using legato, but with brass, I think it's much more context dependent. So take this line, for instance. There, I was just using the sustain articulation. Now, if we switch that to legato, I think it says something very different. Um, 
So now let's start breaking down the piece that this entire session is kind of centered around. And you have this passage in the brass that starts at measure nine. And you'll notice that we have this break in the MIDI data between measures 10 and 11. Now, something very important to keep in mind about legato patches or legato articulations is that if the notes are not overlapping, then they'll simply act like sustains. So here at measure 11, we've basically just triggered a sustain for this first note. Let's hear what that sounds like in context. So by having that break and triggering that sustain at measure 11, we just made the phrasing much more dynamic and interesting. So again, sometimes even if you're using these legato patches, you want to just trigger a regular sustain. Now, if this were actually written out in a piece of music for a player to read, this is what it would look like. And that looks about right. That's probably how you would want to phrase this passage. So again, we're making use of those legatos and sustains to improve the phrasing. Now, some lines just don't call for any legato at all. So here at measure 24 in the Wagner tubas, we're just using sustains. And then in context. So just because you have a legato articulation available for an instrument doesn't mean you always have to use it. Sometimes sustains work just as well, if not better. And the same ideas are going to apply to the woodwinds as well. So here at measure 36, you've got this line in the bassoon and it's doubling the celli. And anywhere you see a break in the MIDI data, that's where a sustain is going to be triggered. Because remember, if the notes are overlapping, you'll trigger the legato transition. Otherwise, you just get a regular sustain. So let's go ahead and hear it. So again, we're just using that combination of sustains and legatos to give us more dynamic phrasing. So let's hear this in context. So by using that combination of legato and non-legato sustains, we were able to achieve the desired phrasing. Now, sometimes you might not want to use any legato at all. So because of the phrasing, all I needed there were regular sustains. So again, just because you have legato available to you doesn't mean you always have to use it. Now, one thing that you should be aware of when working with legato virtual instruments is the legato delay. So with this line perfectly quantized and the metronome on, this line sounds like this. So you could hear that that line was significantly behind the click. And that's just kind of the nature of working with legato virtual instruments in general. Now, there are a couple of ways that you can address this. You can either just pull the notes back manually. So I know that if I pull these back by one eighth note, they will pretty much be right on the click. Now, be sure if you do that and you have a situation like this where your first note and your second note are right on top of each other, just extend that first note enough so that your digital audio workstation registers that note first. Because there's no legato transition going to that first note, you don't have to worry about offsetting that note. And if you do offset it, it'll actually come too early. So this is about what you would want if you were going to try to address this manually. Now, another option is to use the negative delay in your digital audio workstation. Now, I'm going to show you how to do it in Logic Pro, but I can't show you how to do it in the other digital audio workstations. So just to keep that in mind. So I'm going to move these back to where they were, and then we're going to set the track delay to minus 400 ticks. And that's going to be about 130 milliseconds, give or take. And then let's hear this with the second violins. 
and now in the context of the full mix. And that sounded pretty much right on to me. So again, you've got a couple of different options to address legato delay. And the one you choose is pretty much gonna be up to your own personal workflow. So just a few takeaways from this section are again, using a combination of legato and non-legato sustains can really help to improve your phrasing. And just because you have legato available to you doesn't mean you always have to use it. Sometimes non-legato sustains are the right choice. Understanding how dynamics are controlled in a virtual instrument is absolutely fundamental to MIDI programming. So take this viola da gamba key switch patch. For example, I have the legato articulation triggered, and no matter how hard I hit this key, the dynamics stay the same. That's because the dynamics in this particular articulation are controlled by CC11 or expression. Now, we'll cover expression and dynamics more in the next section, but for now, just know that if an instrument isn't responding to velocity, which is just how hard you're hitting a note on the keyboard, then it likely responds to CC1 or CC11. So your velocity sensitive patches will tend to be your shorts, like spiccato or marcato, or instruments like the harp and the piano. So velocity management is obviously a huge part of MIDI programming. Not only do you need it to set the dynamic for a passage, but you also need to use it to add color and rhythmic definition. So for example, in this passage, you can see where we have a consistent dynamic from measure 44 through measure 48. And then you actually have a little bit of a crescendo overall with some accents on the beat. So let's go ahead and hear the violins and violas by themselves. And now let's hear them in context. Now, of course, your digital audio workstation will record the velocity when you go to play the line in, but at least for me, my own playing is inconsistent enough to where I almost always opt to edit the velocities after the fact. So in measure 44 through 48, again, I just wanted a constant dynamic. So if I had played in something like this, obviously those notes would stick out in the mix. So at least in Logic Pro, you can just draw one big line and we're starting at 43. So we want to end at 43 and that's just going to make those velocities perfectly consistent. And in the same way, if I wanted to add accents, I could just select all the notes that I wanted to accent and then just raise those. So I think it's almost always better to edit velocities after the fact because you just get more consistent and controlled results. Now, percussion, especially your big cinematic percussion like the Tycho's and other large frame drums, tend to sound better at the lower dynamics because you actually get a much broader frequency response. So let's go ahead and listen to this passage. This was written specifically to illustrate some other ideas. It's not part of the other piece that we've been using. So 
So you can really feel those Tycos, even though the velocity never really gets above, let's see, this is a 62 out of 127. But again, you're just getting that beautiful broad frequency response. So I generally like to start with the lowest velocity possible and then just raise it until it's accessible in the mix. And I also like to keep my string ostinatos as short and as light as possible. By the way, that also goes the same for woodwinds and brass when they're playing ostinato lines. So you can see here, the velocity is topping out at 85, which is actually pretty hot for me. Uh, so let's go ahead and hear these by themselves and then in context. So obviously that's pretty light. Now let's hear them in context. So again, we've got those velocities turned up just enough to where the ostinatos are present in the mix and giving us that rhythmic definition and drive. And then at 24 with those accents, they're speaking through the mix just a little bit more clearly and adding a little bit more color. Now, something to be aware of is that just because a patch is velocity sensitive doesn't mean that CC1 and CC11 won't have any effect on it. So for example, in the first violins shorts mod speed patch, CC11 controls volume. And then CC1 can actually control the length of the short. So at the lowest values, you've got staccatissimo, then it goes to staccato, staccato on bow, and then marcato. Now brass is where I find myself using those higher dynamic layers in the velocity sensitive shorts because you get that nice punchy brassy edge to them. So here at measure 15, we have the beautiful two trombones patch playing this line and they're starting on a sustain and then we're key switching to these staccatissimo notes here and then going back to another sustain. So I'm gonna go to the articulations matrix so you can see exactly uh, where that's happening. So let's go ahead and hear this. Now, if I pull these down to the next lower dynamic layer, they're not gonna have quite the same punch. And they disappeared from the mix almost entirely. So again, I do find myself using the higher velocities with the brass shorts than the other instrument groups. But again, the guiding principle here is still to keep the velocity as light as possible while still ensuring that the instrument is present in the mix and playing the dynamic that you want to achieve. Far and away, CC1 and CC11 are the most important continuous controllers, which is what CC stands for, to understand when working with virtual instruments. Now, depending on the instrument, CC1 and CC11 will do different things. So for the woodwinds, for example, CC1 controls vibrato. And CC11 or expression controls the actual dynamics. Now, the terminology here might be slightly confusing. You might hear CC11 referred to as expression and CC1 referred to as dynamics or just mod, but that's really just because the digital audio workstations have kind of standardized that terminology. Oftentimes, CC11 is controlling the actual dynamics while CC1 
might be controlling something entirely different. Now, in most east-west brass instruments, CC1 is controlling the dynamics, while CC11 is actually just a volume control. And I really like this setup because brass in particular has such a massive dynamic range compared to the other instruments in the orchestra. And having that volume control handy is just really convenient. So let's go ahead and listen to this example. When I select CC11 and turn it down, again, all I'm doing is turning down the overall volume. I'm not changing the dynamics. So you could hear that the timbre and the swells in the dynamics was still the same. It was just the overall volume that was turned down. Now to see the practical application for this, let's go ahead and check out this passage. Now one thing about brass in particular is that they get that really brassy edge to them at the highest dynamics and it allows them to just cut through a mix like butter. And if you're not careful, they can actually overwhelm a mix. So we can actually pull the volume here down by a good 30 to 40% and you're still gonna hear these in the mix. So that just gave us an overall more balanced and flatter mix, but still notice that we're still getting those big dynamic curves from CC1 that's gonna be giving us all that emotion and the realism that we want to achieve. Now, most east-west string patches, much like the woodwinds, are going to give you that independent control over vibrato and dynamics. So for this viola da gamba patch, CC1 is gonna control vibrato and CC11 controls dynamics. Now, there are gonna be some exceptions to this, especially if the patch has the term light anywhere in it. That's basically just telling you that the vibrato and dynamics control are both rolled into CC1, which is usually, though not always, mapped to your mod wheel, if your keyboard does have a mod wheel. And that basically makes it so that your machine doesn't have to load every dynamic layer of both the non-vibrato and vibrato samples. Now, most of the time, though not always, vibrato intensity is scaling with dynamics anyway. So I use the light versions of these legato patches all the time. They sound great and they're just super convenient. Now, the way that you use CC1 and CC11, I think is probably gonna have the biggest impact on the realism of your compositions, besides of course, just the writing and the orchestration. So here in this passage, the celli are probably playing at about a mezzo forte, but you still need these little swells and these little dips to make it human, to give it some emotion. So let's go ahead and hear it by itself. And then in context. So a real player in an orchestral context is never just gonna play at a constant dynamic. There's always gonna be these slight swells or dips that gives it that human uh, and emotional feeling. So here, if I just make the dynamic entirely consistent, listen to how much emotion and realism is lost. So there really is no comparison there. You lost so much emotion, so much realism when we flattened out the dynamics there. So your dynamics or expression data really needs to look like a roller coaster. So let's go ahead and look at one more example. And this one involves multiple articulations. So these notes here are all gonna be legato. And then these three chords are gonna be staccatissimo. 
Now, because the staccatissimos are going to be velocity sensitive. I don't want any volume fluctuations in that part of the passage. So I've made sure that the volume is consistent there. So let's go ahead and give this a listen. So you can hear the massive impact that CC1 and CC11 are having on the sound here. Now, one other thing I wanted to point out is that I am cheating a little bit near the end because in the dynamics, this is CC1, you've got a decrescendo, but then in the volume, this is CC11, we're actually increasing it at the end. That's just because I kind of lost the French horns in the mix, but I still wanted it to sound like they were performing a decrescendo. So again, we cheated just a little bit, but it still works. And at the end of the day, if it sounds good, then it's right. So let's go ahead and hear this in context. So that, along with the material that we'll be covering in the next video in this series, is about 90% of working with virtual instruments. Once you get these core concepts down, it becomes much, much easier. So definitely stay tuned for MIDI programming part two. Uh, we'll be covering things like articulation mapping and programming runs. So it'll be a lot of fun. So if you liked this video, don't forget to like it, drop a comment, subscribe to the channel, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any future content. That's all for now. Thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Yeah.